Christ the Lord has risen today. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's open up our Bibles, reconciling with God. Let's open up our Bibles to 1 Timothy 2, 5 through 6 in the NIV version. And those of you who don't have Bible apps, there's Bibles in the pews. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to speak for you. May you anoint my tongue. May you anoint everything that I do so that I glorify you and I thank you for this uh, communion day where we get to glorify you and where, where we get to reconcile with you. Heavenly Father, pour your Holy Spirit on me and on the entire congregation. Write our names in the book of life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. <laughs> Today, I'm going, to speak, I'm going to be speaking with you about the atonement of Jesus. Atonement means repairing a wrong or an injury. 1 Timothy 2.6, the Bible says, Jesus Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. In Greek, the word used for ransom is lutron. And the word used for the preposition to or for is anti. So you combine the two, and it's anti-lutron. Anti-lutron means ransom for or to ransom. Paul, the author of 1 Timothy, uses anti-lutron in a very interesting way. This word was used in the time of Paul in the slave markets. At the slave markets, Romans and Greeks had places on the squares of their cities where conquered people would be brought in and sold as slaves. Sometimes the rich people who were masters wanted to exchange slaves, so they'd exchange two slaves for one that was in better health, bigger, and things like that. They'd do these kinds of exchanges. And during the biblical times, the word that they used for this in Greek, of course, to exchange these slaves was anti-lutron. So clearly, here is a reference and an indication to substitution. There's a substitution here between Jesus and the all in 1 Timothy 2.6 for the sake of redemption and buying back and ransoming us. So Paul uses the four and the two preposition combined with the word ransom, which clearly says that there's an exchange happening here. It's a transaction. Hi, Christian. Yay, my friend from a long time ago. Nice to see you. So um, the exchange here is between Jesus and humanity. Christ gave himself as a ransom for all. Is that a reason to celebrate Jesus? Amen. Revelation 5, 9 says, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to, to take the scroll and to open its seals. Why? Because you were slain. That is atonement language. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, and nation, and people. Atonement language again, buying with blood. Let's move on to Revelation 5.12. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Jesus deserves everything because he died on the cross and his death on the cross redeemed us. The blood that he shed on the cross has redeemed mankind. Can I get an amen? 
Think of this doxology for a moment and praise Jesus for what he accomplished on the cross. In Gospel Workers, page 315, Ellen White says, The sacrifice of Christ as an atonement for sin is the great truth around which all other truths cluster. In order to be rightly understood and appreciated, every truth in the Word of God, from Genesis to Revelation, must be studied in the light that streams from the cross of Calvary. I present before you the great, grand monument of mercy and regeneration, salvation and redemption, the Son of God uplifted on the cross. Can I hear an amen? Amen. In other words, the core and the central purpose of studying the Bible is understanding the demonstration of true love that is embodied in Jesus' death on the cross. Without it, nothing else is going to make sense. With it, everything else becomes clear. So that sacrifice of Jesus is at the core of what we believe, brothers and sisters. What do we believe about the death of Jesus on the cross? What is it all about? Why did he die on the cross? That is what the doctrine of atonement is all about. The Bible gives us many reasons for Christ's death, and not all reasons are believed or received by, ev by everyone. Some are taken for granted, and while others might be rejected as well. But right now, I'd like to take a moment of silence to think about this. I want you to ponder in your own heart and in your own mind as you think of Jesus dying and why. I want you to ponder how you've answered this question through the years. Have you taken it for granted? I know I have. It doesn't really make sense for someone to pay the penalty for someone else's mistakes, right? First of all, it's legal fiction. There is no way that any legal system would allow someone else to go to jail for someone else's crime. That is called a perversion of justice, right? <laughs> and if they had to go to death row, there's no way that the justice system would allow for a human sacrifice. But that's just a little taste of what Jesus is. There are so many reasons given to us in Scripture as to why Jesus died on the cross. There's two different approaches to the death, to the death of Christ. There's subjective and there's objective. Subjective ideas focus on me and what that sacrifice, what the death of Jesus does to me, it gives me an example to follow. How does it transform me? And an example of that is in 1 Peter 2, 21 to 24. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So one reason that Jesus died was to carry our sins for us on the cross. He bore our sins for us on the cross. He died our death so we can live his eternal life. Amen. Simon the Cyrene is a biblical example of someone who suffered by literally carrying the cross of Christ. After Jesus was stripped of his clothes and scourged with whips, a crown of thorns pushed into his head, and then he was forced to carry his own cross on his severely wounded body with a crowd behind him, mind you, making fun of him all the way. Can you imagine? He kept falling because the human part of him just could not take it anymore. In Desire of Ages, Page 742, Ellen White says, I'm sorry, it's just very emotional. At this time, a stranger, Simon a Cyrenian, 
coming in from the, the uh, country, meets the throng. He hears the taunts and ribaldry of the crowd. He hears the words contemptuously repeated, Make way for the king of the Jews! He stops in astonishment at the scene, and as he expresses his compassion, they seize him and place the cross upon his shoulders. Simon had heard of Jesus. His sons were believers in the Savior, but he himself was not a disciple. The bearing of the cross to Calvary was a blessing to Simon, and he was ever grateful for this providence. It led him to take upon himself the cross of Christ from choice and ever cheerfully stand beneath its burden. So the atonement of Christ transforms us, doesn't it? it? Just like it did for Simon of Cyrus, if we take time to really contemplate God's love manifested in Jesus' death on the cross, we cannot help but be transformed. I see here also that Jesus died on the cross to give us an example to follow when we suffer for our faith. But like Simon of Cyrus, when you do it out of love and out of choice, it becomes an honor and a joy. 1 John 4, 9 through 12 says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. So, the atonement of Christ also demonstrates God's love for humanity. There are three views of the atonement in these verses. The atonement demonstrates God's love in verse 9. In verse 10, two things. The atoning sacrifice. A sacrifice because Jesus is shedding his blood. And atoning because he's substituting himself for us. The fact that we have a God of love who is willing to sacrifice himself on our behalf that is incredible. The passage everyone knows shows that. John 3, 16. We can say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. Wow. But this is not the only reason for the atonement, friends. Atonement is also objective because there are biblical insights that put the focus on God as the one who benefits from the cross of Jesus, from his sacrifice. Do you want to know how? Because his relationship with us is transformed. Does anyone here Know what it's like to have your kids not want to talk to you or maybe even hate you? God understands. Since Jesus is part of the Godhead, his death on the cross vindicates God's character, God's law, and God's government. Jesus demonstrates that God is both the God of love and of justice, that his law is a reflection of his character, and that his government is founded on these same permanent principles that do not change over time. They are immutable. God loves us. He doesn't change for us. We change for him. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Galatians 3, 13 to 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us 
in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. Romans 3, 25 to 26. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has, fr- who has faith in Jesus. Oh, friends, Jesus' death on the cross reconciled us to God. Sin created a wall of separation, but Jesus broke down that wall through his death on the cross. Both humanity and God are affected as a result of the atonement. Have you ever loved someone so deeply, but that person never asked you for forgiveness and kept hurting you over and over and over again like it was nothing? Did that relationship need reconciliation? Of course. God understands. He understands. He's been deeply hurt. He wants us to ask for forgiveness. Let's go to Romans 5.10. For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. When you hurt someone, just because you ignore it, does not mean that the pain you caused just goes away. That relationship needs reconciliation. There's one more thing that I have to share with you because this biblical aspect of atonement completely melts my heart. You know, some people believe that Jesus died on the cross to take care of the wrath of God. Was God angry? There's a very strong theme in the beginning of Romans that's repeated over and over again, and that is the wrath of God. God is angry with sinners, and he's got to do something about it. There's wrath because sin is the complete opposite of who God is. So God has a complete disinclination and a repugnance towards sin. So did Jesus die to take care of that wrath? Romans 1.18 says, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. 1 John 2.2 answers this verse by saying, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Remember, atonement means repairing a wrong or an injury. So we caused injury to God, and that hurt needed to be repaired. Jesus did this by repairing the wrong with his blood. And he did this for the whole world. Romans 3, 22 to 24 says, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. In the first part of Romans 3, verse 25, it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement. In the the New American Standard Bible version of this phrase, Romans 3.25, It says, 
whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. So in biblical Greek, the word for sacrifice is hilasterion. Hilasterion can mean two things. Propitiation, which is appeasing the wrath of God, and expiation, which is cleansing from sin. Many Christians have questioned the idea of propitiation, of appeasing a wrathful God, because to some it may sound pagan or even satanic. They prefer to speak about expiation, which is the cleansing of sinners for their sins to cover their sin and cleanness and uncleanness. But let's note that Paul does mention the wrath of God in his letters. But even though it's a common concept in his letters, let's remember Jesus is the sacrifice of propitiation to deflect the wrath of God away from repentant sinners. And the key word here is repentant. I'll repeat the first part of Romans 3.25 again in the NIV version. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. So the sacrifice of Christ is received by faith. 1 John 2.2 He is the toning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hebrews 2, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So why doesn't God just forgive sins? instead of requiring the death of Jesus. Because it's not that simple, friends. He's the God of the universe. If God were to ignore the guilt of sin without requiring a payment for it, this would destroy the very moral fiber of the universe and the distinction between right and wrong. It would void his law. Listen, friends, Jesus is not appeasing the wrath of God the Father because God the Father, God the Father, the entire Godhead loves us. Jesus wasn't trying to make God the Father love you. He already loves you. That's why he sent his son. But there is justice. And justice demands an answer. Justice demands to be reckoned with. And Jesus did that on the cross. Jesus came to take care of the, God, the Godhead's wrath against, against sin. The pagans had a concept of propitiation that said that they were the ones that needed to do the sacrifices to appease the wrath of their God or their gods. But in biblical Judeo-Christianity, it's God who loves us, who makes himself the sacrifice to take care of his own wrath towards sin. Because remember, God has an allergy to sin. It's the complete opposite of who he is. He took what sin deserved, which is death. He took it, embraced it, and died for it. So he takes care of the wrath, not us. Why? Because he loves you. He loves you. And as we take part in communion today, I want you to meditate on the demonstration of this unfailing love that is the atonement of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we take part in communion, I pray that You just speak to our hearts, Heavenly Father, and help us to appreciate the atonement that Jesus did on the cross. We thank you. We love you. We celebrate you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So now is the time for us to separate. We are going to do, after we... um, 
we're going to do foot washing. So we're going to separate into different, different rooms. Um, the single women are going to go into the adult Sabbath school room, which is you go right out and to your right. And the families in the fellowship hall right over here, and the single men will go into the community services room, and we'll meet right over here afterwards. 